Welcome to the 10th episode in a series where I'm trying to make high quality PCBs using a cheap CNC router. Now it took a little bit longer to get this video out than I originally would have hoped, and actually it still isn't about the CNC upgrade that I had been teasing in the last couple of episodes. That's still a pretty high priority for me, but it looks like it'll be delayed a couple of episodes from here. And just to be clear, the PCB process has not been problematic at all or anything like that, I've just been busy with other stuff. So in the end, before dismantling my current CNC setup, I got the urge to make one more PCB using it in its current configuration. It probably could have and should have waited until after the upgrade, but honestly, I was just so excited about the results we've seen to date that I just could not hold myself back from making a PCB with an embedded microcontroller, something a little bit more interesting and substantial. I guess one positive from this is that we can prove once and for all that this basically bog standard cheap CNC 3018 can still produce great results using this process. So I had a comment from a nice subscriber suggesting I should structure my videos a little bit better and possibly even provide a table of contents. So okay then, I'm ready to give it a try. And here it is, let's see if it pumps up my view count. So first I'm going to give you a quick look at some of the minor changes I recently made to my CNC 3018 just to make sure that everyone is up to speed. And then I'm going to show the initial concept discussion for this project itself. Next will be a section where I show how I rebuilt the backlight for a recycled LCD that I'm actually using in this project. Following that, I will show you the first draft of the circuit diagram and show you the breadboarding process that I used to test and finalize the design. And then I'm going to walk you through the finalized circuit diagram as well as the PCB layout itself. Next up, we will then step through the process used to make the PCB. And finally, I'll wire everything up and do some end-to-end -end testing to make sure that it all works. And I reckon that should just about do it for this episode. I'm sure you will all be falling to sleep by then. Making the enclosure is going to get its own episode, and the code development for this project will also get its own episode, but that's going to be in my highly popular You Can Do Arduino series. Oh, and before we get started, a kind reminder to like, share, comment, and subscribe if this video is interesting or useful to you. Okay then, let's get into it. As seen in episode 8 of this series, I'm not burning slots for the white text overlay anymore, and instead I'm simply exposing the resin with a laser. And this did not give such a great result, and I now suspect the halo light around the core of the laser beam is causing some exposure in the region outside of where we actually want it. So I came up with the idea of making this blinder, which I can fit to the laser when I'm exposing the resin. It was 3D printed as two separate pieces, which friction fit together and are locked in place with a little super glue. It also attaches to the laser simply with a friction fit, and grips on there surprisingly well too. I put the F mark on the front here to make sure that I always had it installed in the same orientation every time. And as you can see, the design is as such that the cooling fins and fans can still work without a problem. Now when it comes straight off the printer, the hole for the laser is at first intentionally blocked. Instead, the hole is burnt by the laser itself, and this ensures the exact alignment with the smallest possible hole. Unfortunately, I messed up burning the hole for this one, and it ended up a bit oversized. Actually, what I failed to notice is that when burning the hole, some char builds up around the inside edge of the hole. So by just burning straight through, you end up with a coating of char on the inside of the hole, and once you clean off that char, you end up with a hole which is bigger than it needs to be. The filament I chose was also not so great, as this orange stuff is very translucent. I did use a paint pen to try to fix this a bit, but it's still not really ideal. In any case, this is going to be the blinder that I will use for this PCB. But for the next PCB, I will likely make a new blinder printed in a more opaque filament, and also take a little bit more care when I'm burning that hole. So this is what the laser's halo looks like without the blinder attached, and here it is with the blinder attached. I suspect the camera is not giving an exact representation as to where the light is really falling, but I think there's enough evidence here to conclude the blinder is actually having some sort of positive effect and reduces the amount of unwanted light hitting the surface. The other changes I made to the CNC are much more for convenience really. I purchased this little 12 volt 3 amp power supply to power the laser, and that saves me from needing to mess around with the lab power supply every time I want to use the CNC for doing some lasering. I also designed and 3D printed an enclosure for it and directly mounted to the back of the CNC here. On the enclosure itself, I also added some banana plug terminals and that saved me from needing to rewire the laser again and also provides maximum flexibility for the future too. And finally, I dug out this old fanless media PC that I had kicking around and I mounted it onto the garage wall here. I also put the monitor on a VESA arm so that I can swing it around and move it wherever I like. So put that all together and it really saves a heap of space and setup time when I'm using the CNC. Anyway, this power supply and PC additions are something which I can highly recommend. So in this episode, I'm actually going to be making a UV exposing light box. Now, you've all been seeing me use that UV resin exposer to expose the UV resin for my PCBs. 
but that is actually pretty weak and I'm getting a really not great results from it. And you know, at the end of the day, it takes a long time too. So it's not really built to do that job. So what I was thinking to do is get a, an LED light, something a little bit more powerful. In this case, I found this 50 watt one on AliExpress. I think it costs about 15 US dollars if I remember correctly and make a dedicated exposing box for curing that uh, UV resin on those PCBs. So a normal person would probably just stick it in a bit of cardboard box and uh, obviously this light here has its own switch on it so you can just use the switch and you'd be finished. But it, sadly that would be pretty boring so if you're going to do something you may as well do it complicated I guess. Anyway, what my idea is is to make a little project and here it is here, here is the diagram. I'm going to be using this AT Tiny 1616 because I have about 10 of these which I ordered. So let's have a quick look at the details. Basically we have the microcontroller and we're going to have four buttons on the front panel. I think that should be enough. Um, I'm also going to have a display, obviously, and then we're going to have the relay driving. At the moment, I'm doing a, a relay. I'm thinking maybe I change that to a triac. You know, some of these details might change. But then we have the uh, exposing UV lamp here. In addition to that, I noticed that this lamp gets super hot. I mean, they rate this to be, uh, I think it says here, greater than 50,000 hours. But I mean, the back of this, when I when I touched it, it was getting, it must have been, you know, 60 degrees. It was, it was too hot to touch, basically. So that's obviously going to not be good for the lifespan of the unit. So I have all of these junk heat sinks here, which I'll stick on the back here. And I'm thinking to have a fan. And if I'm going to have a fan, um, I notice this fan has a speed sensor on it. So I'll use the speed sensor so we can monitor the speed. So this is the fan here. And I'll also control the speed based upon the temperature, which we'll measure using the DS, what is that, 19B20? I can't remember the number. Anyway, the little um, Dallas temperature sensor, which I'll probably try to attach directly to a heat sink or something like that, so we get a good measurement. Additionally, I'll also have a, a buzzer there, so we can indicate to the user when the exposure is complete. What else have we got? I think I have a uh, an indicator LED also, just so we can see some status without looking at the display. And uh, that's pretty much it. So I'm sort of thinking about this. This is what I originally drew. Display and four buttons, pretty exciting. And all in, encapsulated in the box, the fan, the display and the buttons. Uh, you know, this is really high tech, super amazing stuff. But I, I, I was thinking that basically as this is a pretty straightforward implementation, it has speed control based upon temperature, it has menu, we can have a few presets and you know, we can monitor the health of the situation. So I think it's a, a simple enough project that I can also use this in my programming series to show you guys how to make a simple project as well for those who are interested in that sort of stuff too. A lot of these parts that I've got lined up here are all salvaged. Salvage, 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 salvage. This is probably new, new, salvage. All salvaged. And this is the display that I'm planning to use, which is also salvaged. And the thing about these displays, which I've been showing you before, is that the backlight is dead. Now I'm going to power up the backlight so you can just see how dead it is. I'm not sure if you can see that on the camera, they get a good angle. You can see it's sort of like patchy in its brightness. And um, this is one of the better ones. It looks sort of bright on the camera, but in reality, it's extremely dark and it looks awful. And so I've actually dismantled one of these units over here. And they're pretty easy to dismantle. They've just got these little metal tabs which you can bend, pop it off. And I'll include a photo here, but you can see that uh, this is the backlight board, which I've disassembled from the little light spreader here. And each of these are little diodes, which are actually directly embedded into this board. So this is a very, very old board. It, clearly all of these diodes, or a lot of these diodes, have died. I also don't see any resistor on here, so you must have had to have a lot of voltage to drive this. I'm not really sure. And all of this was covered by this tacky glue that which is like one thin layer which is what we're seeing here with that that color so i want to repair the backlight so what i'm going to do is i'm going to use either green or white leds now the voltage on these white leds are around about 3.3 volts so i can only have one on a 5 volt power supply so i'm thinking maybe i'll use green actually because that will give me a ability to serialize two of them and that should be more efficient in the operation anyway so you can see the little black dots where I'm going to place them. So what I, my idea is I'm going to probably use this heat activated glue and I'll put a few dots on there and then I'll heat the board up and fix it in place and then I'll just do some fine wiring. So I'm not going to show you all that, I'll just show you the result when I get it done. So I finished rebuilding that backlight, I end up using two green LEDs in series and then I used like a 5 ohm resistor because basically these uh, green LEDs, I think they're running around about 2.8 eight volt drop or something like that. It's basically more than five volts. Even so you can actually get them to light up with five volts so the five ohm resistor is just there to make me feel good really. The current is very low. It's 
a little bit over a milliamp per LED string. The whole thing consumes less than probably, well not less, probably around about 10 milliamps, which is pretty low. Also to touch on this red glue that I used, uh, the heat activated glue worked very good to stick those LEDs into place before I wired them up and I'm just using a enameled 0.1 millimeter wire for that which I scraped all the enamel off and it worked pretty good. The light is not really all that great, I mean it's not bad, but you know there's probably some difference in performance of the different LEDs and it creates a bit of a blotchiness so I'm wondering if I can put something else to sort of spread out. You can sort of see there's some sort of blotchiness to it which could be either because the LEDs are slightly off angle or because of some sort of performance difference between the different LEDs. It's not bad though, it's, I think it's quite usable as it is. Okay so just a quick little update here about uh, this design. I've pretty much completed it. A few little details, I haven't named and numbered everything yet but you can see here's the power supply and it's coming from a 12 volt supply which I'll also use to supply uh, the fan and I also have decided to go for a triac, an opto isolated uh, triac type control for driving the uh, UV lamp. I suppose it also gives me the option to dim it if I wanted to but it doesn't seem all that necessary but I might allow it to have some sort of power control on this side, obviously we have the buzzer connector, the fan connector, and I'm also going to sense the speed. And I have a MOSFET here to control the speed. Temperature sensor input, and I also have a programming header here. And I will use the same line also for driving a status LED. The display, and uh, the backlight, which I will also be able to drive the darkness of. Or the brightness of is a better way to put it and I will also have a uh, light sensor nearby so we can automatically control the, the light level of the backlight and then just four buttons so it's pretty straightforward well it's not straightforward I mean for switching an UV lamp on and off it's totally over complicated but I've managed to use every single port on the AT Tiny 1616 that I've decided to use so that always makes me feel good you can see here in the arrangement I've already got uh, the first round of uh, testing completed and uh, using my simple adjust value test here so the LCD display is working well 3, 2, 1 there we go so you can see I'm controlling that uh, UV lamp there I'm using this triac arrangement here so I don't have to use any relay or anything sort of like that so it's nice and silent I also have the display working here, I've just got some test information on there, it's not that important right now. But uh, it has a uh, automatic backlight, so as it gets darker, if I uh, stick my finger on the light sensor here, you can see that the backlight automatically adjusts depending on how dark it is. That's pretty cool. I mean, totally unnecessary, but still pretty cool. I also have uh, this fan, which I think I'm going to use, it's this is a fan that I've from an old CPU and that was a lot trickier than I thought it was going to have to be but in the end I managed to have the dynamic speed control based on temperature so I had a little uh, temperature sensor down there which will actually be mounted onto the onto the light so it can monitor the, the temperature and address the uh, fan speed but that was a bit of a whole lot of uh, a separate drama to get that working and then I have what else have I got here I have this buzzer and this uh, LED which I'm going to use for status information and I wanted to drive them somewhat independently so I had to come up with a tri-state arrangement for that which was not that difficult but it was a bit of a problem. I, basically I ran out of uh, IOs on the ATtiny uh, 1616 if you can believe it so that's what I did for that. So Obviously we have the buttons and um, we have obviously the MOSFET driver for driving the uh, triac Opto coupler thingy. Ah, so it's alright. I think it's looking pretty good. Now let's take a look at the final circuit design and the various changes that I needed to make to get everything working correctly. So let's look at the small stuff first. On the power supply, I have added a 250 milliamp self recovering fuse here on the input, as I thought that would be a nice idea. For the temperature sensor, I needed to switch to a 3-pin connector with a dedicated 5 volt supply rail. This is because I couldn't get it to work in the Parasite power mode. I read that some of the Chinese knockoffs of this Dallas sensor don't implement Parasite power, so that's probably what Ali sent me. Thanks Ali. 
The next change I needed to make was how I connected up the photoresistor. The way I originally had it resulted in a very limited voltage swing, with the result being the A to D converter only worked within a very small value range. Naturally that gave a very coarse result, causing very large brightness jumps in the LCD backlight as it auto-adjusted. Simply put, it was more annoying than helpful. So to fix this, the photoresistor was shifted to the bottom of the voltage divider, and the supply voltage for the divider was changed from 5 volts to 12 volts. With that, the value return now travels across the entire 5 volt range from dark to full light, giving a full 1024 adjustment steps. So now the automatic adjustment on the backlight is as smooth as silk. And moving on, the opto-isolated triac circuit also required some changes, specifically removing the snubbing RC networks. To be honest, I'm not really familiar with this type of snubbing. Personal snubbing, yes. Electrical snubbing, not really. But apparently triac snubbing is done to ensure the proper on-off operation for some type of inductive loads. Well, that's what I read in the datasheet anyway. In my case, however, when I tested with the snubbing circuit in place, I found that in the off state, the UV lamp was still being dimly lit. Anyway, removing all of the snubbing related components solved the problem and the UV lamp can now fully switch on and off. And of course we have less components to deal with, so it's a good result all around. So next up was the first of the more complex problems to deal with. Actually, there was no easy way I could figure out how to make the programming pin to do dual duty as the output pin for the status LED. So I spent some time testing and fiddling around with it a bit, but in the end I just gave up. I mean, think about it. Once the MCU starts up and switches the programming pin to act as an output, of course you can't program it anymore. Anyway, it's just messy, so leaving the dedicated program pin alone makes more sense to me. Even so, I didn't want to give up on my status LED, even though I'd run out of IOs on the ATtiny 1616, and I must say I was left asking myself about my life choices at this point. I mean, how in the hell have I managed to use up all the 17 usable IO pins just to turn a light on and off? And I still have a deficit of one output. It just doesn't make any sense. Anyway, to solve the problem, I came up with this tri-state arrangement, which now makes the output that I was using for the buzzer do double duty. So with this design, I can either have the buzzer or the status light switched on, but they can't be switched on at the same time. In any case, I think it's a fair enough compromise. The design I used is actually inspired by the classical bi-coloured LED control circuit, but instead of LEDs, I'm using the optocouplers to create those two separate outputs. In fact, this design seems a little bit like overkill, and possibly there's a better way to do it, but actually it's extremely cost effective, and only uses about 8 cents worth of components. It does however take up a little bit more space than I typically would have liked, but for this board, I have the space, so it's not really a problem. You'll also see that the transistors were added to the outputs of each of the optocouplers, and this is in this Darlington style configuration. I had to do that because I found the optocouplers transistors were not really giving enough power to drive the loads. Actually, I probably would have preferred to use a MOSFET like this to drive the loads, but at the time I didn't have any SOT 23P channel MOSFETs on hands, so it is what it is. The next problem I needed to solve was controlling the fan speed and detecting the fan's RPM. Actually, I thought it was going to be easy to do this, but in the end it really wasn't. First up, I tested the hall sensor to make sure I understood how it worked. I did this by using an optical sensor and a bit of tape on one of the blades to generate a pulse for every rotation. And then by looking at the output of the hall sensor, I could confirm that there are two pulses for every rotation of the fan. So, so far, so good. And that seems to pretty much match with what I had read on the internet, seemingly that most PC fans give two pulses per rotation. However, the trouble happened when I tried to use my classic low side MOSFET to PWM control the fan speed. The problem is, is that for the duration the MOSFET is off in the PWM cycle, no power is supplied to the fan. But that also means no power goes to the whole sensor either. So what you end up getting is an AND style signal combining the PWM pulses with the whole sensor's output, and obviously that's not so useful. So to fix this, I redesigned the driver circuit so that the fan now always gets a stable 5 volt supply, and on top of this, using diodes, I'm combining in a high side switch 12 volt PWM supply. Basically this gives me about a 40 to 100% power control for the fan, while still ensuring that the whole effect is constantly powered. Now I'm not sure that if classical PC motherboards do this in a similar way, I guess they might, but it all seems a bit overly complicated to me. Actually in hindsight, the way that I designed this high side MOSFET control circuit was actually not really so great. And this diode here seems to serve no purpose at all really. And the voltage divided values that I had to use ended up being very tricky to get right, and super sensitive to the model of the MOSFET that was being used. Ultimately it works fine, but it would have been better to use a MOSFET in place of that diode and gotten a clean 0 volt to open signal and not the 0 volt to 5 volt swing that's provided by the ATtiny. As it is now, when the PDM signal is high, there is always some reverse current flowing into the ATtiny input from the 12 volt rail. Of course I've set the resistor values high enough so that it's not really going to cause a problem, but it's really not so great either. Actually, it'd be nice if you could just set the ATtiny to operate in open collector mode for the PWM signal, but I didn't figure out how to do that. If someone knows, then let us all know in the comments. Possibly it's just not that hard to do, and I'm just being too lazy to figure it out. But anyway, it's working, so I just left it. 
On a related side note, however, I've been doing an upgrade recently for my 10-year-old PC setup, and I noticed that fan connectors for motherboards are now all four-pinned. So this got me a little bit intrigued, and after some research, I found out that with this new design, the power rails are no longer PWM switched, and instead there is a dedicated PWM control signal, which is separate to the 12 volt power rail. This seems much better actually, and what it means is that the MOSFET PWM power switching is now done within the fan itself. And there are a number of obvious benefits from that too. First, having the power MOSFET in the fan should reduce the risk of damage to the motherboard itself. Second, as all the power switching is now done inside the fan, you're pretty much free to use any size or type of fan you like. It could even be brushless, right? Thirdly, as the power supply rail is now always constantly stable for the whole sensor, you can now control the fan to much lower speeds. So that's it for the circuit design discussion. Next up, let's take a look at the layout of the PCB. So this is going to be a single-sided board, and here we are looking at from the copper side of the board. Now this time I've gone with a single-sided board because there's really no downside in doing so. And obviously it's quicker and easier to make a single-sided board than a double-sided one. Now the resolution of my PCB processing is such that using a single 1206 size 0 ohm resistor I can jump over four signal traces. And for this board design I actually only needed four of these 0 ohm resistors to make all of the necessary jumps. So that's going to be much more easier than trying to make another layer of the board itself. Actually, in designing this board, I've sort of come to the conclusion that single-sided boards will make sense in probably most situations, actually. It seems that double-sided will only really be needed where the size is absolutely critical, or where I'm dealing with lots of multi-bit data buses that are crossing over each other. When I'm designing a board, I always place my immovable items first. In this case, that would be the pin header for the LCD display, and the control buttons. The LEDs and the light sensors also have limited options where they can be located too, so they are placed next. And the AT Tiny should naturally be placed close to the LCD header as it's got lots of sort of connections going to and from that. I also wanted the high voltage stuff to be in a corner of the board where it can be well isolated. So that's why I put the triac down here. You can also see the copper is well cleared around the triac and I've also added some little fins here for heat dissipation. This is where the triac's opto isolator crosses between the boundary of the high voltage and low voltage world. So effectively we have an air gap between these two areas. Well it's more like a plastic gap. That's good enough. And now finally the last pieces of the puzzle are placed. The tri-state optocouplers fit nicely here next to the status LED and naturally the buzzer connector also is placed nearby too. The power connector and power supply staff are here in the bottom left corner and just to the right of that we have the driver circuit for the fan as well as the fan connector. So all we have left then is the programming connector and the temperature sensor connector and they are located here next to the AT Tiny itself. So that's about everything. Super happy with the way this board layout went and it was a fun little puzzle to solve. In hindsight, there were only a couple of changes that I probably would have made. The first would be to make the pads for the photoresistor larger, as this actually has a mechanical loading given the extended leads, and in fact I ended up tearing off one of these pads while fiddling around with a board. The second would be to use 0805 size resistors for the fan control circuit. For some unknown reason, I placed them as 1206 size. Actually, in the end, I needed to change these resistors a couple of times to get the values right. So the 1206 resistors ended up being a bit of a blessing disguise, as they're much more easier to hand solder. Okay, next up, let's take a look at the process of making and assembling this board. So the first step is to coat a copper board before the resist burn. In this case, I took the opportunity to try out the new UV lamp that I'd bought. The resist burn went very nicely as always, and the etch result was pretty good too. Next up, applying the mask resin layer, and all that turned out pretty nice. For the white text overlay, I did a number of test runs on a cutoff piece first, testing various different settings to get the exposure level right. This result does seem improved from the board that I made in episode 8, but it's still not so great. Hopefully next time, by using an improved version of the blinder, I will get an even cleaner result. You can see for this board, I actually used the holes in the PCB as the locating holes. By doing it that way, I could use the PCB stock right to the edges, which really minimizes the waste. Here in the same step, I have run both the board cutting and pad clearing operations. This time for clearing the pads, I'm trying a new technique where I burn the larger pads first with a more powerful setting, and then go over all of the pads using a weak power setting. Under the microscope, you can clearly see that some of the larger pads are now fully cleared, whilst the smaller pads still have some residue left behind. To get this method to work, I actually needed to add all of the large pads to a user layer within KiCad, and then create a separate G-code file to run. It's not super convenient, but I think it's not that bad either. It definitely should be better than dealing with burnt off pads or needing to do lots of manual clearing. So it seems like this new method is very promising, but I still need to tune the settings more before I can declare a complete success. 
So this is what the pads look like after a manual touch-up and a polish. All looks pretty good. Sadly, however, drilling the pad holes did not go as smoothly. First, I managed to break my two only 1mm end mills in quick succession. And then, even though I used a 1.2mm end mill for the LCD header, the holes ended up being closer to 1.5mm. In fact, at first, I thought I might even need to redo the entire board, but thankfully it was still usable. I expect the root cause of this is one and the same for both of these problems. That being excessive run out in the spindle, collet holder or the collet itself. All these are cheap garbage, so what do you expect, right? Anyway, this is definitely something I need to address in a future CNC upgrade. And a final look at the completed board before populating it with the components. Obvious areas to improve is the quality of the text overlay, as well as the hole drilling that we just touched on. You can see here on the other side of the board I used the laser to burn a connector information overlay. That worked pretty well, and I think it's pretty useful too. So here are all the bits and pieces ready for assembly. But first up, I used the laser to cut a stencil for the paste, same as you've seen in the earlier episodes. This time, however, I also included the holes for the heat activated glue. Seems I had the laser setting pretty high this time. It even cut through the backing paper. In fact, if I remember correctly, I think I gave it two passes just to be sure. Anyway, it's better than having any little hanger on us that I'd have to deal with later. Locating the stencil by eye is accurate and easy to do. First up, I laid in the heat activated glue where it needed to be. And then I laid in the 183 degree solder paste, being careful not to disturb the glue the best I could. After removing the stencil, it looks really cool with the two different paste colours. Unfortunately, the sticking power of the stencil was too strong and ripped off some of the text overlay where the larger font was used. Actually, it even ripped off a large area of the mask resin, but thankfully that was only in the cutoff bit of the board. The label sheet that I'm using states that it's removable, but clearly the bond is not weak enough, so I'll probably have to find something that's a little bit less sticky. Next, all the surface mount components are placed. Sadly for the 0805 LEDs, I needed to manually apply the glue. The size is just simply too small to do this with the stencil. Some of you will have probably noticed that I modified some of the through-hole type components leads to be surface mounted. Actually for the optocoupler devices, there are surface mount versions available, but from what I could tell, they just look basically the same as how I modified them, so it's cheaper and easier just to use what I had on hand. For the Triax, there are TO263 surface mount packages available, but as I have had these TO220 ones on hand for probably over 20 years now, it makes sense to finally use one here. In any case, the size is much the same. For heating the board this time, I need to do it in two stages. First stage is to cure the thermally activated glue, and I need to heat that up to 130 degrees and then let it cool down again. Thankfully, having my PID controller for my new hot plate makes that easy enough. And an interesting thing was that even though that I'm using the 183 degrees solder paste, you can see that it still somewhat appears to melt even at 130 degrees. But after the first cooling cycle, the solder finish sort of goes very matte, so I don't think the solder is fully melting at 130 degrees, and it did not look to be creating much surface tension either. So to fully melt the solder paste, I then heat the board back up to 185 degrees, and after that cools down, the solder this time sort of keeps a decent shine, but maybe not as shiny as a proper lead-based solder does. For the next PCB I make, I think I will try without using the heat activated glue and just see how the 183 degree solder paste behaves on its own without any of that help. I'm sort of suspecting that the floating components issue that I saw before is mostly a problem with the lower temperature 138 degree solder that I was using then. If the 183 degree solder works well on its own, then I'll probably limit the use of the thermally activated glue to very special cases. Anyway, it's always nice to have on hand. So this is what the board looks like before IPA cleaning. And even after cleaning, I still need to knock off a few of these solder beads here and there. The flux in the solder paste seems to be super stubborn and it's really hard to clean off, even with lots of scrubbing with IPA. And you can see how the beads really cling onto the flux as residue. Overall, the soldering looks really good and I didn't need to do any touch up or anything like that. Even the through hole packages that I modified got a good coverage as you can see here. Now most of you have probably noticed that I'm always snapping off the excess now only after doing the surface mount work. I think that sort of makes the process much easier to deal with having those extra ears on the board there to hold and, and deal with while you're doing that surface mount work. I also got this nice new toy for Christmas, thanks to a timely Amazon sale. It makes quick work of cleaning up the edges of the PCB. Actually, if you're not careful, it will quickly grind off a lot more than you want to. So here I've added the photo resistor to the board. And on the other side here, you can see all of the connectors have been added too. I actually have an outline mark here for the location of the track so that I can add the heat sink later here. 
You can see I've soldered a modified pin header to the LCD display. So all I need to do now is solder the display to the PCB. Actually, I'm not really sure if the display would be called the daughter board or if the PCB I made is the daughter board. Let me know what you reckon in the comments. And I hope you're enjoying my nice yellow fingers. Seems I got a hole in my glove while doing the etching. Well, I guess that happens. The last two pins of the LCD header row is actually for the backlight, which I will need to run a couple of wires for. And there it is, all done. And you can see where I've added those wires here. And this is how the boards overlap together. Actually, it's all held together pretty rigidly. On the back side here, I've stuck on the little heatsink for the triac. I also printed this little cover for the high voltage area of the board. I definitely want to remove any chance of me accidentally electrocuting myself. It simply fits in place like this and will be held in place with a plastic pin with a spring clip. Actually, it's a really snug fit and I'm pretty happy with how it's come out. So here you go, I've got everything wired up, uh, ready for testing. So the idea is to obviously wire it all up before I actually put it in the in the box that it's going to end up in and make sure everything works and then it's just a matter of putting it in the box obviously. So we have the 12 volt power supply which is getting the power from this main switch which I have here. This is the original switch that came with this light. And uh, from then obviously we need to power the, the UV lamp as well which is also mains powered but that uh, power is going through the solid state switch here and then back and into the light. And beyond that we have a temperature sensor which will be affixed to this light in some way. And we also have a buzzer and we have this CPU fan which I'm going to use for the cooling. And this line here is for the programming and as you've seen before I'm using the Arduino Uno as a programmer for this. So yeah, that's all together there, looking pretty nice. So I have a little test routine plugged into this, so let's get it on the tripod and I'll give you a look at this running. It just tests all the IOs and make sure everything is connected up correctly. All right, so let's turn the power on, see how things go. So this is testing the status LED, which is obviously working correctly. The buzzer. And the UV lamp, which is being switched on by the solid state switch. And then we can test the buttons here and see that they're all working. You can see it says X when you press the button. Down, left, right. And obviously you can press multiple buttons at the same time because that's the way it's connected. I haven't got enough figures to press all the buttons at the same time. So yeah, that's working good. And this is the final test routine that I have which tests the temperature sensing and the light sensing. So for the backlight, I'm actually using this photoresistor here as I've probably explained before. And you can see the photoresistor result there is 112. And if I cover it up, you can see that the backlight, the BL figure is going up. If I cover it right up. It's quite bright because I have this light here so it's not going to go to the full 255 but you get the ID idea and you can see it's not overly reactive I've got uh, some good averaging in there to stop it from overreacting so that's quite good and up the top here we have the amount of additional power being pumped into the fan so this is uh, currently running at its low speed and that will go up to 255 depending on the temperature and we have the RPM here which is just measuring the RPM directly from the fan and we have the temperature, which is being measured from this little sensor. So if I stick my finger on here, it's going to get warmer. But that's not going to get warm enough with my fingers to get this fan going any faster. So let's put a bit of heat into that sensor. Got this uh, hair dryer here. That's at max speed there, so about 4300 RPM is the max speed for the fan. It's already cooling down. You can hear the fan slowing down, you can see the RPM there. So I think that's going to do the job. And there you go. That'll be about it for this episode. In the next episode, we'll be making an enclosure and getting everything installed. So thanks so much for watching so far, and I do hope to see you in the next episode. So see you then.